Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time of worship. Father, we thank you that we have found a love greater than life itself. Lord, that love is in you, and that love is demonstrated by you sending your son Jesus into this world to die on that cross to be our Savior, to save us from our sins. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue to, to work on our hearts, Father, and to open our eyes and help us to, to see uh, what you want us to learn this morning. And so we ask you to meet each of us, Father, at our point of need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Time was running out. I had sailed through the, uh, all the courses for my doctorate of ministry in three years, right on schedule, just like I was supposed to. But, but the final requirement uh, for getting the degree was to write a doctoral thesis. This was the Mount Everest of my academic career, and I'd worked off and on, on, on it for about six or seven years. But having a full-time ministry with a growing church and a, a full-time, being a full-time dad and, and a husband, I just had a hard, hard time finding the extended time I needed to be able to pull this thing off. But then one day, I got a letter in the mail from Denver Seminary, and they said that time has run out. I basically had a little over a year to complete that, that thesis, and if that wasn't done by then, sorry, uh, you don't get your degree. The clock was ticking. And so, man, I jumped in with both feet, and I just tried to start working on this thing like crazy, and spent hours and hours and hours of research in all kinds of libraries. And I made several trips to Denver Seminary to do research, to talk to, to professors and advisors. And every Wednesday when I was home, I mean, I worked from dawn to, to night on that thesis as well as other times in the week. And really, I was coming along pretty well, and I'd written most of the thesis, uh, but then I had to go to Denver and meet within one of my advisors. And uh, everybody had always warned me, okay, Bill, whatever you do, boy, just pray you don't get an advisor from the New Testament department. Well, guess what? That's exactly what I got. I, the advisor they assigned to me was a professor from the New Testament department, and this guy wanted to add all this stuff uh, to my thesis that, that I had been writing. And, and among other things, just to give you an idea, he, he wanted me to write about a recent New Testament scholarly debate concerning Paul's first century theolo theology of law, which had been sparked by the recent discovery of some ancient papyri that had shed new light on the first century Jewish perception of the Torah. Are you kidding? <laughs> I was just stunned. I mean, this, this is like going back to the drawing board and starting all over again. I was running out of time, and I thought I was almost done, and now I had to begin on this whole new, exhaustive line of research about something I knew absolutely nothing about. Well, I happened to be staying at the Best Western Hotel near the seminary, and man, boy, you should see my room. There's books stacked up everywhere and papers all over the place. And I remember just getting on my knees and, and leaning against that bed and just crying out to God, God, show me the way, lead me, help me know how in the world to do this thing. And as I was praying, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 uh, kind of flashed into my mind, and I began praying that verse back to God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. That's what I needed. I needed some direction from God. So I prayed and I told him that, you know, I prayed through this. Prayer. I'm trusting you, God. And, and I didn't have any trouble at all not leaning on my own understanding because I had no understanding about all that stuff they're talking about. And, and I just tried to acknowledge God in all, all my ways and just told God that I was going to depend on him to direct me and show me what I needed to do. And then I got up off my knees and things were different. I mean, really different. I, I felt this peace. There was still the urgency, but I felt this peace and I felt just deeply within my heart that God was going to lead me to do whatever I needed to do to finish this thing. And slowly but surely, by the grace of God, he did. Listen, although the Bible, it gives us all kinds, I mean, a ton of information about many, many, many things uh, that are morally right or wrong for us to do. But there's still a lot of other things that the Bible doesn't specifically tell us about. Like, should I marry this person or not? Should I fire this person 
Should I hire that guy? Should, what, what am I supposed to major in in college? My, my husband wants a divorce and I'm devastated. What am I supposed to do? My kids are into drugs, they're getting in all kinds of trouble. What exactly do I do, God? And on and on we go. We have to make all kinds of decisions like this, and the answers are often not specifically spelled out for us in the Bible. So what do we need? We need what we've been talking about for the last 14 weeks. We need wisdom. And this morning, Ed, we're going to conclude this series by looking at that verse, Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. I mean, those two verses. And we're going to try to look at how to get guidance from God. Let's pray. Pray about that. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are the almighty, eternal, omniscient God. And we thank you, Father, that you love us and that you care about us. And Lord, we just ask right now that you would guide us in those areas we need your guidance in. And Father, I'm sure there are those of us here this morning who are facing a particular situation. who are having to make a certain decision and they really don't know what they should do. Father, speak to our hearts. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, that we might see what you're saying to us today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. How do we get guidance from God? Well, what Solomon tells us first of all is that you need to place the full weight of your trust completely on God. The full weight of your trust completely on God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, that little Hebrew word for trust is batach. And batach literally means to, to lean with the whole body on something in order to be supported by it. Uh, if I had a, a chair up here and I was trusting in that chair, I'm saying that I can put my whole weight down on that chair and trust that that chair is going to hold me up. It's not going to collapse. And figuratively, then, batak means to trust, to rely on someone or something to put confidence in or to believe in a person or an object to the point of reliance on it. Well, how much are we to trust God to get his guidance? We are to trust the Lord with all of our heart. Wow, that's a lot. Because heart in the Bible, that means the inner you, the person that really is you. All that is you. It's talking about your mind, how you think, your intellectual processes. It's talking about your emotions, what you feel, what you experience. It's talking about your will, what you determine to do with your life. So here's what God's saying. He's saying to us this. You want me to give you some guidance concerning the way to go and the life situation you're, you're facing? Okay, then I want you to trust me. I want you to lean heavily on me. I want you to place not some of your weight, but the full weight of your trust completely on me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Well, what specifically are we supposed to trust God about? Well, there are a lot of different things we could say, but let me suggest three really important things we need to trust about God that helps us in getting his guidance. And first of all, we need to trust in the person of God, the person of God. One author writes this. God is consistent, but he is also unpredictable. Would you agree? God is un you never know exactly what he's going to do. He is consistent in his nature, what he's like. You always know where you are with God, but you seldom know what he's going to do. Next, now listen to this. You cannot find security in what God is doing. There's only security in who God is. In other words, let's say that you're trying, you're, you're trying to uh, trust God with some horrible mess at work, and it's just bad. Everything's going from bad to worse, and everybody's mad at each other, nothing's getting done, and you are just don't know what to do. You have no idea. So you turn to God and say, God, this is a mess. I really don't know what to do. I, I don't know which direction to turn. Please show me a way. God, I'm trusting you with this. Now, what we can't do is trust in what is immediately going on, the circumstances of that mess, because things might be very chaotic. Things might be, you know, falling apart. You know, it might be that things are going to get worse before they get better. But that's okay. 
That's okay, because guess what? Your trust is not in those circumstances. Your trust is not in what is or is not happening in the present. Your trust is in God and who he is. Your trust is it in him that eventually he, in his perfect time, he's going to work this thing out for you. Well, what do we specifically need to trust about the person of God, about who he is? Well, let me encourage us. We need to trust him. First of all, this is kind of foundational. We need to trust that he is your savior. You know, a lot of times people get into a jam, they get into a mess, they're going through a scary situation, and they just cry out, ah, God, help, 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 let me get out of this. And they're not even believers. I, I mean, they don't give God the time of day on any part of their lives except when they get in a jam. And really, truth be known, they've never really bothered to, to accept the gospel they've heard about and really uh, believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. Never done that. So, so Jesus is not your Savior. And listen, if Jesus is not your Savior, you can't expect to get any guidance from God. Not any. Another thing you have to trust, that God is infinitely wise and he's the one true source of all wisdom. In other words, you got to trust, if you want God's guidance, you got to believe that God has the answer to your difficulty, that there is an answer, that, that he knows the way out. Now, you don't know it, but he knows. You're trusting he knows it, that he in his perfect wisdom already knows exactly the next step you need to take, exactly the direction that he wants you to go in. In other words, he knows who you're supposed to marry. It's not a mystery to him. You know, he knows whether or not you should start that business. He knows the best way for you to raise that challenging child. And part of trusting in God uh, is that you believe that you're banking on the truth of what Solomon says in Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. That's where it comes from. And from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. And this one's really important. We need to trust God, if we want his guidance about his person, we need to trust that he genuinely loves and cares about you. Genuinely loves and cares about you. In other words, if you're seeking God's guidance, you need to know that he's in your corner. You need to know that he cares, that he really is interested in you, and he wants the best for you. And if you know that, yeah, that kind of security of knowing he loves and cares for you, you can trust whatever direction it is that he sends you in. You know, again, I began the doctorate program when I was serving as a pastor in Orlando, and, and there was a there was this tough issue that's going on in the life of the church there. And I figured, well, here I'm out of seminary, all these brilliant guys. I'll, I'll see if some of these professors can maybe give me a little advice. So I went to a couple professors, and the first one I went went to, I didn't really know too well, but he was a pretty famous guy. I mean, everybody knew this person. He'd written a bunch of books. I'd read read some of his books. He's a nationally known Christian leader, and I figured, well man, he'll be able to steer me in the right direction. So I told him about the problem we're experiencing and uh, over lunch together, and I'll never forget his advice. His advice is this, well, Bill, maybe you need to drop out of the ministry for a while and just sell life insurance. <laughs> Whoa! I just kind of took the breath out of me. Are you kidding? My goodness. So I was kind of staggered out of there, and I, I went to his other professor that I knew really well, and he had actually recruited me. He had come to Orlando to, to, and got me to go to Denver Seminary. And I'd taken several of his courses. And this is a guy I really respected and really admired. And I told him that this issue that a church was going through, and I shared also what this other professor had said. He said, Bill, that's crazy. I, I think you're a great pastor. In fact, and this shocked me even more than what the other guy said, I'd love for you to consider coming to my church and being a pastor right here in Denver. I knew that professor loved me. I know he, he cared about me. And so his advice, I could trust. And actually, the first professor, just to give a little side note on that, uh, a, a few years later, it was discovered that he had a long-term affair with this woman, and he was forced to resign from both the seminary and his church. You've got to be careful who you listen to for guidance. In his book, Thoughts in Solitude, this great Christian philosopher and theologian, you want to read somebody deep, 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 uh, not in the fluff. He, it, it, Thomas Burton, he's the guy. He's a kind of a mystic, a Christian mystic. 
but very good. And he wrote this uh, prayer called, and has been come to known as Merton's Prayer. And it's so real, it's so good. And, and he's praying this prayer, and he's not sure what direction to go. I mean, he relates to us, right? Well, sometimes we just don't know. But he's trusting God because he knows that God cares about him, and he knows that his God will always be there. So listen to his prayer. Here's what he prays. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I'm following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you're going to lead me by the right road, though I may not know anything about it. Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear for you are ever with me and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Boy, there's a good prayer in it. Here's another thing we need to trust about the person of God, and that is that he is completely good. Completely good. In other words, when you're going to God for guidance, you need to know in your heart of hearts that God is perfectly good, that, that he's not mean, that he's not malicious, that he'll never lead you in the wrong direction, that he can be trusted to always do what is right because he is perfectly good. So we're to trust in the person of God. That's the first thing. The second thing we need to trust about God is in the power of God, that he can do anything. In other words, you know, if you're going through, you're trying to find guidance and there's all these obstacles in the way, you got to trust that God has the power to get those obstacles out of the way. But here is easily the hardest thing that we need to trust about the person of God and his guidance, and, and that is the plan of God. See, a lot of times, a lot, and I've, I've been guilty of this, you know, a lot of times Christians come to this very passage, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, and basically, we're really honest, you know, we want God to make our plan happen, okay? You know, and God, this is a job I want. Please, 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 let, let, it, let, it, let me get it. Well, God, this is the house we want to buy. I know we can't afford it, but help the sale to go through. Or, God, I want to make the cheerleader squad, so please, pretty please, let me make it. Or, God, just bless my plan, my plan, my plan, what I want to do, what I want to do. But that's not at all what this verse is saying. N not even close. It's not what it's saying. Because the truth is, maybe God's plan is for you not to get that particular job. Maybe God's plan is for you not to get that house because he knows it's loaded with termites and it's a lot better one uh, down the street. Maybe God... His plan for your life is you not to make that cheerleader squad because he knows that for you, where you are in your Christian walk right now, it wouldn't be a good thing. It would be a bad thing for you. And the point is, in order to get God's guidance, we need to trust the plan of God. What about the plan of God? That his way is the best way, even if you don't understand it or like it. Let me say that again. We need to trust the plan of God that his way is the best way, even if you don't understand it or like it. That is real trust, like God's talking about in Proverbs 3. You know, I, I went to Vanderbilt. It was a great experience. I just loved that. I, I learned a lot, had a lot of fun. But you know, Vanderbilt was not my first choice. It was actually my last choice. I kind of shared this a while back. But, but I, you know, I prayed and prayed, and there's these other places I wanted to go, and those doors were closed. I, I just didn't get in those schools, and, and I didn't like that. I, I was forced with my fourth choice. I, I didn't understand why God did that. But now I see clearly that God's plan for me was the best plan. You see, if I hadn't gone to Vanderbilt, I would never have met Julie Atkinson, and I would have never married her, and that would have been one of the greatest travesties in the world, okay? And if I hadn't married Julie, we wouldn't have had these three wonderful boys, Billy, David, and George. They would never have existed. Unbelievable. And if I hadn't gone to Vanderbilt, I wouldn't have gone with two friends one time over a Christmas break down to see this place called Dallas Theological Seminary to check it out. 
And if I hadn't gone to Dallas Seminary, I wouldn't have become a pastor. And if I hadn't become a pastor, I wouldn't be here right now today. God always, always knows exactly what he's doing. We've got to trust him, though. We've got to trust that his plan is the best plan. Even if at the time you don't understand it, even at the time you just flat out do not like it, you've got to trust him. John Cavanaugh traveled from the United States for to work for three months at the House of the Dying. And the House of the Dying was the mission where Mother uh, Teresa worked there in Calcutta, India. And Cavanaugh was going over there because he was looking for a clear answer to how he should spend the rest of his life. And so he gets there, and on the first morning, he, he meets Mother Teresa. And she looks at him, and she asks, well, well what can I do for you? And Kavanaugh asked her to pray for him. Well, what do you want me to pray for you, for you, she asked. He said, pray that I have clarity. Mother Teresa said, no, I will not do that. He didn't understand, well, why won't you pray for that? And she said this, clarity is the last thing you're clinging to and must let go of. He was still confused, and, and, and he said, well, he told her, well, you, you seem to have this clarity. You know your purpose. You know where, where you're supposed to be here, and, and that's the very kind of clarity that I'm longing for. And she just started laughing. She said, listen, I've never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. You want God to guide you? You want God to lead you? You want God to show you the way to go? Well, it all starts right here with this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the plan of God. That his way is the best way, even if you don't like it, even if you uh, don't understand it. And you know why we can you know, trust in a, a plan that we don't like or don't really understand? Here's why. Because we can trust in the person of God that we talked about. We can trust that God, the one we're asking for guidance, he's your savior who died for you so that you could have life. And, and this God we're, we're praying to for guidance, he, he is infinitely wise and he loves you and he cares for you. And he's completely good. And let me tell you, we can trust, we can rely, we can place the full weight of our trust completely on a God like that. Elizabeth Elliot did. In her book on guidance, she writes this. This is a great, great quote. She says, we do not come to God asking for advice, but for God's will. And that is not optional. To ask for the guidance of God requires abandonment. We no longer say, well, if I trust you, you will give me such and such. Instead, we must say, I trust you. Give me or withhold from me whatever you choose. And she says, as John Newton says, Lord, give me what you will, when you will, how you will. How do we get God's guidance? Trust. That's the first thing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The second thing is don't rely on yourself and what you think you should do. Don't rely on yourself and what you think you should do. And we find that in that next phrase. It says, and lean not on your own understanding. Now, this Hebrew word for lean is, is sha'an, and it's very similar. It's almost the same thing. It's very synonymous with the word for trust. And it means this, uh, the lectionary say, to lean on, to rely on, rest in, depend on. That is, to have trust and belief in an object to the point of being in jeopardy if the object of trust fails. You're, you're leaning on it so hard that if it doesn't work, you're going to fall. You know, as I shared last week, you know, some of, most of you were here, but and we had this little surprise 60th birthday party, and the, the church now opened the light, surprise, and everybody's here, and the first thing was, I was greeted with was a walker, you know, my own walker for being six years old, still kind of getting over that, but it, it makes it a little better, it was Vela's, you know, so she, that she let me them use it for that occasion, but, but yeah, you look at those, you ever look at those, those little walkers, man, they're light, you can pick them up, they're, and they're made out of aluminum, but let me tell you, they're sturdy, I mean, that, they're built so that you can lean your whole weight on that and not worry that's gonna, gonna fall apart, you know, and, and, but let me ask you, what if don't, you got a walker, and it wasn't made of aluminum, but it was made of flimsy cardboard. Would Miss Vella be able to lean her weight on that and not fall down? I don't think so. 
No, that, that wouldn't, you couldn't lean on cardboard. That just wouldn't work. You, know, you should lean not on a cardboard walker, for if thou doest so, thou will, willest fall upon thine face. And that's the King James Version, you know, just, just throw that in everywhere. So, when we're trying to figure out what in the world we're supposed to do, what direction we're supposed to go in, we are to lean not on our own understanding. Now, please don't misunderstand. That doesn't mean that we're not to think, we're not to plan, we're not to carefully consider the facts and weigh and balance things and really look at it. God gave us brains, and he wants us to use them, and he wants us to get better and better at making these decisions as we lean on God. But it just means this. To lean out on your understanding means we don't just rely on ourselves to figure things out. That, that's just plain out, plain pride. It means you don't act independently from God. Instead, we lean on God. Instead, our primary trust for guidance in anything, it's in Him, not ourselves. Proverbs uh, talks a lot about the foolishness of trying to, trying to do that on our own. It says, Proverbs 3, 7, do not be wise in your own eyes. If you're wise in your own eyes, you're a wise guy and you kind of think you don't need God, God, okay? Proverbs 28, 26 says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. That's pretty blunt. But he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. And then the familiar Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seems right to a man, but it in the end, it leads to death. Ken Sandy um, shares in one of his books a, a terrific story. He says this, One day during my morning run, I noticed a blind woman walking on the other side of the street with her seeing-eye dog, a beautiful golden retriever. And as I was about to pass them, I noticed a car that was blocking a driveway just a few paces ahead of them. And at that moment, the dog paused and gently pressed his shoulder against the woman's leg, signaling her to turn aside so they could get around the car. I'm sure she normally followed his lead, but that day she didn't seem to trust him. She had probably walked this route many times before and knew this was not the normal place for them to make a turn. Whatever the cause, she wouldn't move to the side and instead gave him the signal to move ahead. He again pressed his shoulder against her leg, trying to guide her on a safe path. And she angrily ordered the dog to go forward. And when he again declined, her temper flared. I was about to speak up when the dog once more put his shoulder gently against her leg. Sure enough, she kicked him. And then she impulsively charged forward and ran right into that car. Reaching out to feel the shape out in front of her, she immediately realized what had happened, and dropping to her knees, she threw her arms around that dog and spoke sobbing words of apology into his ears. She thought she knew the direction to go. She'd gone that way hundreds of times. She knew she was right, but she wasn't. And that's the way you and I are sometimes. We think we know what we should do, but we're blind. We're blind. We can't see the future. We, we can't see one minute in the future. And so we don't know what lies ahead. Our knowledge is extremely limited, but not God's. Not God's. He sees perfectly what lies ahead. And he always knows the direction that you and I need to go in. And we just charge ahead and just full steam ahead, you know, do what we think is right without paying any attention at all to God. We're like that blind woman who paid no attention to her seeing eye gog, and when we do that, we can run into a lot of trouble. And sometimes that car's not just parked, sometimes it's moving. And we can get in a lot of trouble if we go ahead of God. You want to get guidance from God? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Third thing, Third thing we need to do is invite God into every single part of your life and let him be in the driver's seat. Invite God into every single part of your life and let him be in the driver's seat. Not you, but him. And we find this in that little phrase, in all your ways, acknowledge him. 
Now, unfortunately, this word acknowledge, this translation, it's a terrible and misleading translation of the, the actual Hebrew word that's used here. Because here's why. When you and I, when we hear uh, acknowledge someone, it usually means that, you know, you see someone, you kind of know them and, and you want them to know that you, you know who they are. So you kind of acknowledge them. You, you nod your head, and maybe wave and go on your way. And, and that is not at all what this verse is saying. I mean, it's not talking about that we should, you know, go through life and just kind of, hey, God, okay, acknowledge him and you know, let him know you know he's there and just go off and do whatever you want to do. It's not what it's saying. This Hebrew word is yada, which means to know. And scholars tell us uh, that yada means to have personal knowledge and intimate experience with someone, to have genuine fellowship with someone. Talk about knowing God in that way. So here's the idea. You know God in all your ways. That is in every aspect of your life. In every single part of your life, we walk in intimate fellowship with him. Knowing God in all your ways means this, that we are seeking to know his presence every day in everything we do. You know, uh, some, some uh, uh, saints in the past have called this whole thing practicing the presence of Christ. So here's the idea. You go through your day and you are knowing God in all your ways. You're experiencing fellowship with him throughout your whole day. You're talking with him. You're consulting with him. You're enjoying his company. You're asking him for, to guide you along the way. So knowing God in all your ways is experiencing him right there with you when you're, when you're checking out at Rouse's and you're standing behind, you know, three grocery carts of, of groceries that some boat order is doing. OK, God's right there with you. He's right there with you. And God is right there with you, aware of his presence when you're working out at peak fitness, when you're getting up at five in the morning and, and killing yourself at a spin class with, with Jordy. Uh, it means that you're, he's, he's right there with you when you're paying your bills, when you're cashing a check at, at, at the bank. It means he's right there with you all through the weekdays and all through the weekends. And you practice his presence. Then when you're driving in a car, when you're stuck at a bridge, you're practicing his presence when you're teaching a Sunday school or when you're fishing and having a great time catching speckled trout. You practice his presence when you're cooking a meal, when you're washing the clothes, when you're changing a flat tire. It doesn't make any difference. You, you practice his presence when you're at a life group. You practice his presence when you're out at a restaurant eating. And an important aspect, well, this is so important, we would like to kind of skip this part. But an important aspect of knowing God is obeying God. And here's why. To know him is to obey him. So with God right there with you throughout your whole day, guess what? He's the boss, not you. You seek to do his will, not your will. He's God, you are not. And since he's the Lord, you submit to his lordship over all of your ways, over your entire day. And that's an important part of getting God's guidance. It's submitting to him and obeying him in your life. Phil Yancey wrote about a, a friend of his named Susan who told him, quote, that her husband did not measure up and she was actively looking for other men to meet her needs for intimacy. And Yancey writes this, when Susan mentioned that she rose early each day, to, each day to spend an hour with the father, I asked, in your meetings with the father, do any moral issues come up that just might influence this pending decision about leaving your husband? Susan bristled. That sounds like the response of a white Anglo-Saxon male. The father and I are into relationship, not morality. Relationship means being wholly supportive of me and standing alongside me, not judging me. Sorry, it doesn't work that way. She's way out in left field. She just did not get it. If you want God to guide you, if you want God to lead you, you can't be openly, knowingly, intentionally, with no thoughts of repentance, rebelling against what God is telling us to do in his word. Now, you, you can't be committing adultery and asking God to guide you. Well, which one should I marry? This just stick and stay with him or go. You can't be living with somebody before you're married and ask God, well, Lord, really help me know if this is the right guy. Don't expect an answer. It's not coming. It's just not. It doesn't work that way. Here, here's a quote I, 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 I listened to a, a week or so ago. It's great. You can't abandon the principles of God and walk in the blessings of God. 
Let me repeat that. You can't abandon the principles of God and walk in the blessings of God. That, those two just don't go together. Now, an important part of getting God and his guidance is to invite him into every single part of your life and let him be in the driver's seat and not you. A lot of times we reach over, we want to grab that wheel away, but, but no, no. Okay, God, you're in control. I'm going to let you be in charge here. You do it. You drive. I'll just buckle up and go with you. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding and all your ways know him. And what's the result? The result is, and he will make your paths straight. Now, that verb in the Hebrew for make straight, yashar, means to make smooth, to make straight. So for God to make your path straight, that doesn't really connect with us so much. But, it, but here's what it means. So, several things. First of all, it means that he's going to keep you on the right track that leads to the right end. OK, you know, you're trusting him. You're leaning on your own understanding. You're knowing him, author. Then he's going to help you stay on the right track. It also means, be on your outline, that he will lead you to do his will. He's not going to lead you to do your will if it's opposed to his will. He's going to lead you to do his will. Os Guinness is a brilliant um, philosopher, a Christian philosopher. And, and uh, actually, the last couple of years of Bill's life, he got an opportunity to meet this guy and spend a little time with him with some organization he's involved with. But in the early days of his Christian life, he, he thought, you know, had this conception, you know, if you're a Christian, if you're, if you're really committed to Christ, then you're going to become a missionary. You're going you're gonna to become a pastor in a church somewhere. So he was urged on by some well-meaning mentors. And, and so Os Guinness, you know, joined the staff of a church and became a pastor. And he was absolutely miserable. But God began to change all that one day at a gas station. Here's what Guinness later wrote. In the days before self-service gas stations, I had just had my car filled up with gas and enjoyed a marvelously rich conversation with the pump attendant. As I turned on the key and the engine to my car roared to life, a thought suddenly hit me with the force of an avalanche. This man was the first person I had spoken to in a week who was not a church member. I was in danger of being drawn into a religious ghetto. Ten minutes of conversation with a friendly gas pump attendant on a beautiful spring evening in England, and I knew once and for all I was not cut out to work in church as a minister. And so Os, Gu Os Guinness went, went back to his knees and he continued to pray and to seek God's guidance. Okay, if that's not it, what do you want me to do? And, and he figured out and what he discovered, what God led him to, was that God was calling him to work out there in the world where he could rub shoulders every day with, with non-believers who didn't know Christ and he could use his considerable gifts and talents to build relationships with those people and win them to Christ. God had led him to do his will. You know, make your path straight also means that he will clear the path of obstacles so that you can successfully reach your goal. Clear the path of obstacles so that you can successfully reach your goal. Now, in biblical times, we've talked about this before, but if a king was traveling around, you know, out in the country down a road and, and he has his servants with him, they're either carrying him in some kind of a contraption or he's in a chariot or something they're coming along the path and they're over here well uh oh here's a tree in the road or here's a big old boulder and it's falling it's falling down a roll and so instead of going around that obstacle he would have his servants take the tree out of the road move the boulder out of the way so that he could literally make straight his path and so making straight your path in proverbs 3 6 is also referring to god clearing the path of obstacles, of anything that stands in the way of you successfully doing what God wants you to do. And that's what God's will to do is. So if we do our best, and we, none of us do this perfectly. We all fall on our faces. We all stumble and, and have trouble and difficulties doing this. We never do it perfectly. But if we're really, that's our intent. Remember that prayer that I desire to do. That's what I want to do. God, help me do that. But if we're doing our best to trust in God, you know, with all of our heart 
and we're, we're really trying to lean on him and not on our own understanding. And we're trying to know him, invite him into every aspect of our life and obey him, you know, of what he says to, for us to do. We do that. He's going to give us his guidance. He's going to help us. He's going to help us successfully find the right way. He's going to remove any obstacle that's standing in the way of that path that God wants you to go down. He's going to move, remove it. It might seem impossible, but he's going to do that because he's a powerful God. And Chuck Swindoll, I'll close with this. He shares a, a great true story about a conversation he had with a Christian leader who, who wanted to start a new ministry uh, for navigators uh, down in Uganda in Africa. And the man told Swindoll that after a lot of discussion, a lot of thought and prayer, that he and his wife were convinced that God wanted them to move to Uganda. So they uprooted their family. They, they hopped on a plane. They all flew to Kenya where he put his family up in a hotel and he rented a Land Rover so he could kind of travel across the, the border into Uganda and kind of check the place out. And the man told Swindoll, one of the first things that caught my eye was when I came into the village where I was going to spend my first night, where it were several young kids with automatic weapons shooting them off in the sky. As I drove by, they stared at me and aimed their guns my way. Naturally, he kind of said, God, are you sure about this? Is this really what you want me to do? And finally, after you know a long day of uh, exploring Uganda, uh, he pulled up in his little Land Rover into this dingy, dimly lit hotel. And inside, he walked up to the desk, the registration counter, and the clerk, who spoke just a little bit of English, told him there was one bed available in the whole place. So he said, I'll take it. So he grabbed his bags and walked up two flights of stairs. He opened the door. He turned on the light. It was just like an exposed light bulb hanging in the middle of the room. And he looked and he saw two beds, one an unmade bed and one a bed that was still made up. And he immediately realized, uh-oh, I'm sharing this room with somebody else. And just a chill went down his spine. He got the three songs, but not good ones. Okay, at this point, he definitely needed the kind of encouragement that only God can, can give. So the man told Swindoll this, I dropped to my knees and I said, Lord, look, I'm afraid. I'm in a country I don't know. I'm in a culture that's totally unfamiliar. I have no idea who sleeps in that bed. Please show me that you're in this mood. And then he said, just as I was finishing my prayer, the door flung open and there stood this six foot five inch African man frowning at me, saying in beautiful British English, what are you doing in my room? I kneeled there for a moment and, and then I muttered, they gave me this bed, and I'll only be here one night. What are you doing in my country, the African demanded. Well, you see, I'm with this Christian organization. It's called the Navigator. Oh, the Navigators! And suddenly this tall African man, he just broke into this huge grin, and he threw his arms around his room roommate, picked him off the ground, and started dancing around the room, said, Praise God! Praise God! said the African. And here's what he said. For two years... I've prayed that God would send someone to me from this organization. And then he pulled out a little navigator pack of memory cards. He said, look, look at this at the bottom. The Navigators, Colorado Springs, Colorado. And then he asked, are you from Colorado Springs? And he asked, and he said, yeah, I am, but I've come to Uganda. I'm going to start navigators here in your country. And so the work began. And this Ugandan eventually became a board member on the, the board of the navigator staff of Uganda. And, and this guy, he helped this, uh, this American missionary to, to uh, find a place to live and to learn the language. And this guy that God sent to him became his very best friend. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways know him and he will direct your I'd like to conclude this worship this morning by, by transitioning into communion. And if the ushers can come forward and prepare to re, re, turn out the, give out the bread, that'd be great. Just the ushers come on forward. And you can begin to go ahead and, and pass out the bread. And as you're, I'd like you to hold that little piece of bread. We'll all receive it together. And here's what I want you to meditate on. You know, communion is, is to remind us about what Jesus did on the cross. And here's what I want you to think about. 
Think about how difficult it was for Jesus to do that. You know, sometimes we think, oh, yeah, you know, well, Jesus is God. And of course, he could do it because he's all powerful. No big deal. It was a big deal. He was 100 percent God, but he was also 100 percent man. And the Gospel of Luke in particular says that the night before he, he, he went to the cross for you and me, that he knelt down in prayer and he sweat and he was so anxious, he was so stressed that he began to actually sweat drops of blood. That's how difficult it was. And he was praying fervently, God, if there's any way that I don't have to do this, I don't have to be separated from you, I don't have to experience the wrath of God of you from all, for all man's sins, let there be another way. But he ended it with, and that's why we're here today, but not my will, but your will be done. So think about that. Think about what it cost Jesus to die for you.